Welcome to the Board of Finance meeting. Mayor Weinberger will be joining us just slightly late, so I'm going to get us going. Um, so I'm going to call this meeting to order at 5.04 p.m. Um, and the first item on the agenda is the agenda. Um, please note that item 5.02 has been postponed. And is there a motion on the agenda? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the motion carries. Um, the next item is public forum. Are there members of the public who would like to speak? Yes, but no one has, is raising their hands. So we will go ahead and close the public forum. We do have a couple of items on the consent agenda. Do I have a motion on the consent agenda? Uh, so we'll take the action, um, uh, adopt the consent agenda and take the actions as indicated. Excellent, is there a second? Second. Great, thank you, Councillor Barlow. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And that motion carries unanimously. We are on to item 4.01, which is amendment of a work agreement um, for the Redstone Tank Rehabilitation. Who would like to start? Division Director Megan Moyer is going to hit this one. Thanks, Megan. Excellent. Great. Please go ahead. Hi, all. Um, hopefully the memo explained it, but basically um, this project was set to be uh, started and completed several years ago prior to the COVID pandemic, um, in part because of COVID delays, but also because we've been wrangling, wrestling, uh, whatever the appropriate uh, verb is with our cellular leasey. Um, we have cellular antennas on our tank. It does bring in revenue to the city. Uh, it's been longstanding, but in order to do our tank maintenance, we need them off. Um, and figuring out exactly how to do that um, has been a bit of a challenge. We think we are making headway, uh, but the maintenance company, the rehab company did inform us that for multiple reasons, as we're all seeing, uh, that there is an inflationary cost uh, increase. Fortunately, we were able to reach out to um, our, our lessee and discuss the situation and they were willing to make a cost sharing payment that happens to be uh, the same value as the cost increase. And so overall it is a budget neutral um, impact to the uh, water, drinking water fund. Great, thanks again. Are there any questions or is the board ready to make a motion? I don't have any questions. I'm happy to make the motion as part of the jokes. Okay, thank you. President Paul, is there a second? I'll second. Great. Sorry, Councillor McVee, uh, Councillor Barlow just beat you to it. Um, are there any other questions or discussion? Are we ready for a vote? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And the motion carries unanimously. And that brings us to item 4.02, um, a request to execute a contract with ADS Environmental Services, bless you, for the flow monitoring and data hosting services. And we're back to Division Director Moyer. Hi, y'all. Uh, so this effort, um, you know, I'll say at the outset, I know it seems like a lot of money, uh, but this data is imperative, not just for meeting regulatory requirements, but also to make sure that we're able to design cost-effective approaches to reducing and hopefully in some cases eliminating combined sewer overflows. Um, across the nation, people are finding that these monitoring efforts Having tightly calibrated models enables us to design right-sized systems and not over-design or under-design and then have to come back. Uh, it is a function that we've tried to do in-house. Uh, Ashley Linty is one of our water resources engineers. She's a PE, 
And she's been spending vast amounts of her time during the summer months um, trying to keep these flow meters um, running. Uh, they're in very harsh environments with lots of, you can imagine, in a sewer, toilet paper, all sorts of things that people flush down the toilet can get hung up on these meters and rip them apart and they have to be put back in. And it's not as easy as Ashley just going out by herself. These are confined spaces. She's not allowed by OSHA standards to enter them herself. And so it actually takes up to three people um, at a clip in order to get in. Um, and so we, as a trial, uh, with our um, hydraulic and hydrologic modeling update. We worked with a actual company who specializes in this, has seen all of the crazy manholes that you can throw at them um, and knows how to install these meters so that they're uh, less maintenance intensive. And then also they're monitoring them. They're figuring out if they're not responding. And so we don't find out after the fact, after we've had an event, oh darn, you know, one of those meters wasn't working. Uh, so we have found it to be incredibly helpful. The, the data quality is, you know, excellent. Um, and we are recommending that the city make this investment so that we have this continuous data stream source and can do right by the city when it comes to designing uh, the next slew of projects. Excellent, thank you. Any questions from the board? Yes, Councilor Barla. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, is WRD, so they'll be doing the, um, if there's a problem, they'll come and, and, and fix and maintain as well. Yeah, so they own the equipment because we've tried owning our own equipment and trying to keep up with the capital investments of losing sensors down the sewer and whatnot. Um, so they're monitoring it, they're installing it if we need to move them around, um, and they're coming and doing the maintenance when a sensor or something is non-responsive. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a, it's turnkey. It's not us doing part of it and them doing part of it is a complete thing so that my staff who need to be focusing on all the other city projects can be focused on those and be getting the data as necessary versus having this other duty that they have to do on the side. Additional to that, I'll add to that too. They also provide um, an initial quality analysis of the data too. So it's not just the raw data that we see on the hosted website. They actually go through and what we do what they call scrubbing data, where they'll actually clean up the data and present that and provide that information to us um, on a monthly basis. It enables us when we have a CSO. In the past, we would have to just estimate the volume of the CSO, you know, between a thousand and ten thousand gallons or a hundred thousand gallons, which none of us want any gallons to go out. And being able to say the exact amount of gallons that went out is, I think, important for us and the public and maintaining trust. And then also demonstrating that with the, some of the projects that we're implementing, we are actually decreasing the amount over time. Excellent, any other questions? Yes, Councilor Jane. From early 2022 to now, what, what, what system were you using to monitor the overflow? Uh, previously, we were using a system called uh, Blue Siren. We've always had alarms um, at our combined sewer overflows, which just tell us it's overflowing versus it's not overflowing, right? Because that's something that's been in place for a while. Um, the recent emphasis in 2016 is on really knowing what the volume is. And so we did uh, purchase ourselves and implement uh, Blue Siren technology, which was, it was good, but it had a lot of problems. Ashley spent a lot of her time troubleshooting. It would, you know, cell signal would go out. Um, I think sensors would get blinded. And the systems only lasted, I think, about five years. Uh, basically, they reached the end of their useful life. And so that's why instead of just going out and purchasing additional, we looked at other ways of doing this in this more turnkey approach where the company is doing the capital investment. Like if they have a meter that dies, it's on them. To replace it for the same, you know, monthly cost that that they quoted us. My question, yes, is so the blue sign and ending. The light ended in early 2022, but I'm asking from early 2022 to now, what system were you using? What were you using to monitor? Yes, we were using the ADS uh, system. So they were procured by our consultants. Our consultants went through a procurement process and looked at the two uh, regionally available full service flow metering companies. Um, and so we've had a year's worth of experience with ADS, which is why we feel um, confident that they are a good 
a good vendor to move forward with. Obviously, at the end of the three years, we will do another procurement process and make sure that their value is still good compared to the other regional company, or maybe there's another regional company that sprung up. Does that answer your question? All right, thank you for the answer. Wait a bit, but it's okay. Um, and, you know, I think the funding is coming 25% from water, from, from water, water, wastewater, and 75. So basically, there won't be any additional fees. This is all under budget, and this is exactly how we would be using to pay for it, pay for these 470. Yes, it, it's in the FY24 budget and will be in the future budgets. Any further questions? Are we ready for a motion? I'd be happy to make the motion. Thank yes. you, Councillor McGee. Is there a second to the motion? Also, Thank you, Councillor Barlow. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes, yes, sure. Sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah. Um, Speeding I, through. I mean, I, this is this is such an amount of um, investment and was just also wondering um, if you can regular can see can monitor whether or not this is good. So if there are progress report, maybe good. But, yeah. You know, uh, yes, we can absolutely have to uh, or whatever. Yeah, it's the right committee that would, uh, you know, review how this is going uh, periodically before we're getting to the end of the third year term to figure out what to do next. So we don't need to put it in the motion, we just... Uh, I would say if you, yeah, if you want it documented so that none of us forget, I would say put it in the motion. <laughs> okay. So, can I have the motion? Sure. I just want to confirm you, I couldn't hear because the kid TV show in the background, you would like the two to review the results prior to the yes. expiration of the con. Okay, awesome. No, I'm fully on board and it would be great to share the data with everybody so they can nerd out like we do. Excellent. So we have a first and a second with our friendly amendment. Are we ready for a vote? Great. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you for your support. Have a Thank good you. Monday. And that brings us to our first budget presentation. Um, Mayor Weinberger, would you like to kick us off? Yes. <laughs> um, I will kick us off and then I think and I will try to tag team this overview. Um, and uh, Catherine will share on the uh, people online the PowerPoint. Um, my uh, start by saying, you know, and I think probably we say this just about every year, and probably every government feels this way just about every year. I think this is, a, this is our, it's a challenging budget year. Um, uh, from my sense, having done, I guess this is the 12th one now that um, uh, I'm responsible for. In some ways, um, this is certainly uh, similar to the other three pandemic era budgets that we've done in that there is a lot of moving parts and complexity to it and challenges. In some ways, I would say um, that first pandemic budget certainly felt excruciatingly hard. This one, I think, is the hardest one since in that we have um, uh, just a variety of uh, new pressures or expanded pressures that, that we'll go through. So um, we will, we're going to walk you through uh, what, what these pressures are and what they mean. They mean a, a very significant uh, gap when um, uh, in some sense at this point in the process. And then we have a number of solutions to close the gap that I think are, 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 are reasonable and, um, uh, and doable. Um, so that's, that's sort of, that's sort of the, the outlines of this presentation. We'll start with the problem and then we'll go to the solutions. 
um, <clears throat> for uh, counselors who are going through this for one of the first times, you know, we we have where this is headed and we'll, we'll review the schedule at the end, but we have about a month now uh, between we met today and when a uh, little, little more than a month uh, between today when the administration will submit the, the budget to the council. Um, it is always our goal to submit a budget that is ready for you to uh, basically approve. We will, um, and we, we're not there tonight. There will, there's work that is gonna need to happen over these remaining five weeks to get us where we're, we need to be. Um, you will also have after tonight, the departmental presentations where um, we get in to what's going on in a little more detail than this is going to, what's going on within the departmental budgets. So um, with that set up, uh, why don't we advance? We have a kind of want to go through first paragraph basically says what I just said. Here, here are really the big factors that make uh, that, that is making these budgets tough. The we've had unprecedented um, cost of living adjustments, maybe not unprecedented in the state's whole history, but much higher than in recent years in the in the cost of living adjustments that um, uh, are in the union contracts really driven by inflation. So the big jump was last year's budget, the FY23 budget. We have another big jump in this year's budget. And if you recall, we didn't increase the taxes. The way I think it's important to remember, we um, did not, uh, we were not successful at getting a, um, a voter um, increase for the co colas last year. So we sort of have two years of colas that we are um, needing to uh, digest in the FY24 budget. That gets easier. Unlike some of these other things are gonna get harder in FY25 and the 26. The COLAS return, we've negotiated for the next two years, just one year. Uh, two some of the contracts, it's two years, years. yeah. Public safety. Right. Work. So um, the next next year, we will be much more down with what we're used to dealing with a 3% COLA. And um, that'll be the case for the next two years on the non-public safety contracts. The public safety contracts, I guess, we'll have to, we'll, we'll have to start negotiating soon. Um, the... Uh, one of the reasons that we were able to get through the last couple of budget years without tax increases is because of just how um, uh, understaffed our um, police department was. And that is, we are projecting, and hopefully this is the case, that that is turning, continuing to turn around in the year ahead. And that, so the, the assumptions in this budget have um, about seven more officers over the course of the year uh, than the current year budget. It also has, you may remember, we negotiated three new firefighters to try to address the really enormous levels of overtime that we were seeing in the, in the fire department. Um, and that, that was negotiated in the last contract. And we also are gonna be closer to full staffing of the CSO and CSL programs. So you add all those things up and those are a bunch of costs in this year's budget that weren't in last year's budget. Um, inflation is hitting the rest of the budget. Isn't all this that third bullet says? Although we, you know, that, that's it, the city has to deal with inflationary costs in lots of areas. Um, and then this is a one that, particularly for counselors who've been around for the last few years, I hope people remember and you know know that we are we intentionally um, committed ourselves to many new equity initiatives in 2020, and we. Initially, we were very explicit and uh, clear that we were funding those initial investments in 2020 with uh, the federal funds. And um, we have been phasing these out over, over the, this is the third year of being phased out. Um, and so the federal funds or one-time funds that are in the budget in Three years ago is two million seven hundred sixty thousand. We only have nine hundred seventy thousand in this year's budget, and this is one of the things that gets even harder next year because that nine seventy uh, goes away. Um, not there will be some costs that go away as well. Some of these are for costs that are will go. Yeah, we'll, we'll disappear with that funding, but that's going to be a challenge for next year. 
Um, more, more factors. The revenue side continues to be uh, somewhat unpredictable and has not fully recovered in all areas. Frankly, we've done pretty well on the revenue side, um, uh, but uh, it's we're still down in in you know, particularly in some waterfront boat slip areas and parking um, and uh, the. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about revenues when we get into some of the solutions. This is, I think it should be noted that Catherine has been managing this at the same time. We have been managing um, uh, some pretty significant other uh, uh, challenges in the clerk treasurer's office, including the, the, the waterfront TIF audit and pretty significant staff transition. Um, that in future years is another thing that should get better and that we uh, I believe we're close to hiring a budget administrator that will um, bring a whole new capacity to, to future budget budget years. And so that's a position we've created recently and that's going to have going to help. Um, and, you know, this is just sort of restating the point that we we have not seen an increase in our voter approved taxes since 2020. That's particularly hard. I think it's worth repeating because because of the structure of that a lot of people don't appreciate of municipal revenues is our revenues, the, the uh, about half of our total revenues that come from the property taxes really only increase for two reasons, growth, development, investment of new uh, new investments in in the city, which historically has been, even though we're doing quite well right now, uh, it's historically it's been or you know one percent or less in terms of revenue growth from one year to the next from from development. Um, and so, inflation is above that. The only way that the that that kind of half of our revenues keeps up is if there is a voter approved increase to the rate. Um, and so, to have you know going on through a fourth year without a um, um, increase to the voter approved rates, it, you know, really starts to create some, some pressures that bite. So uh, let's go on from there. Um, this is sort of a very simplified kind of summary of, of, of what this all, you know, what this boils down to. And we kind of start the presentation and where we are today in some ways is we have a $5 million problem uh, for next year's budget. So what are we going to do about that problem? Um, or I guess we have a little more detail on what, what's 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 driving that. I mean, it gave you some flavor for that with the opening, but um, do you want to walk through these? You want me to keep going, or you want to walk through some of these? Uh, so sure, yeah. I'm happy to give you a break. Okay. Um, so a large part of the increased cost, um, as the mayor alluded to, is coming from increased personnel costs. And you can see on these middle two bullets, that is particularly true of the increased costs for the police department and the fire department. Um, that last bullet um, includes the COLA increases for non-public safety staff, as well as um, some of the general inflationary issues that we're dealing with. Um, but as you'll see, by and large, um, we have asked department heads to kind of absorb those um, in terms of we asked uh, budget heads to, department heads to level fund their operating budgets. Um, so we're feeling the pinch, but um, in some cases that may mean having to make tough choices. Um, one thing we have not talked about yet, but I'm gonna put kind of a pin in it because there is more detail is this $1 million of vehicle fleet costs. Um, so just put that pin in and we're gonna get back to that. Um, every year we do have um, budget principles that guide us through this process. Um, these will look familiar to you. Um, good budget principles should not change drastically year to year. We want a um, process that um, is continuous. Um, so I'll just walk through these quickly. 
um, restoring public safety and making sure we have those resources is a top priority of the budget. And we are trying to balance that with minimizing increases to the tax burden. Um, then layer on top of that, that we are trying to retain current city employees. And that has been a big priority um, that we've discussed with this body and city council since 2020. Um, you know, I've had the good fortune of being in this very challenging, interesting position all through the pandemic. And um, I'm thankful that that has been one of our guiding principles throughout is um, the commitment that we've made to our employees. And we've been able to find really creative budget solutions throughout um, some of our uh, leaner years so that we haven't had to make employment actions. Um, so we have focused our cuts on non-personnel budget lines, um, but that does mean we are not adding very many new initiatives. Those that we're adding are things that are funded outside of the general fund. Um, what you will hear several times throughout this presentation is that um, Although we look at each year's budget um, on its own, really we see this as the first step of a multi-year plan to help us address all of these challenges coming out of the pandemic. Um, the money that we got first through the Elgar grant and then through ARPA really helped to stabilize and to ensure we didn't have to take employment actions. But now it's really up to us to figure out where do we go from here. Um, continuing to go after federal and state money through various grants will continue to be a part of that, as will figuring out new revenue opportunities. Just one, just check sure. you. One bullet, um, the fourth bullet there. Um, mm. You will see we have. When we get to, we don't have more detail on this presentation. We have a, we still have proceeds from the uh, last bond that, last capital bond, the $24 million capital bond from several years ago. This is the final year where we will be drawing uh, down on that um, that bond. It's going to allow us to, it's, it's a challenge budget there too, but it's going to allow us to more or less uh, keep this heightened level of street, sidewalk, um, <clears throat> in particular uh, investment, um, as well as some of our other public assets that we've had since 2016 and the big capital plan push there. This is something else that needs to go in the multi-year plan that, that that bond will be done after this year. And we don't have uh, the ability to bond further given the agreement we have in place with the, the school department and, and, the, and the high school. So um, we that's something else we're gonna have to think hard about and it's gonna be a challenge for, for future budget years. I'd say you know, pretty much every year from now through maybe as long as 2030, hopefully it will be less than that uh, if the, because we are having some success with bringing in some state federal funds for, you know, Maybe maybe the whole one hundred sixty five million dollar bond will not need to be drawn drawn down. There's still a lot of work going on on that, and there's reasons to be hopeful. But the benefits to that will be in the out years. So we de that's definitely another challenge we will um, talk about when we get to the capital budget, and that we should be thinking of in terms of like kind of multi year plans from here that are going to be needed. Just one quick correction. The Capital Committee has been working hard to make sure this isn't our final year, but we are running out of money. So I think the final draw will be in FY25. So okay. it's still not to take too much away from your point, but poor Ashley sent me a text like it's not the final year. All right. All right. So we are getting there, but we don't. All right, good. It's, not total, that. it's not total panic just yet. Um, I mentioned a little bit of uh, the budget direction that we gave to department heads. Um, 
We are, that included funding, staffing at current levels. The only new hires in this budget are in public safety. Um, revenues continue to be aggressive, but realistically budgeted. Um, we do have more money for um, a revenue replacement reserve. You'll recall we had $2 million um, for last year's budget, and we have another million for this year's budget. And then I mentioned um, operating budgets, uh, meaning non-personnel line items are level funded with a couple of exceptions. And you'll see those here and sure understand why they needed to be exceptions. Um, now we get to some of the um, budget solutions that we uh, have come up with. Uh, do you want to take back over? Yeah, why don't I talk to you here? So there's three big strategies and um, they're kind of summarized here. And then um, we have some additional detail on each uh, that kind of rounds out the presentation. So um, just to hit them and these total up to the, the $5 million challenge. Um, the first is um, there is a, <clears throat> um, basically the council has the ability somewhat unique within the, the budget authority that the, that the council has to make sure that parks are properly funded. And um, we have not used that authority since 2013 and uh, to raise additional revenues. And I think we need to, uh, to consider it this year and we'll have a little more of that. Secondly, the people remember, councilors over here will remember at least that we have in the current year budget, the FY23 budget, a $2 million revenue replacement reserve. The idea with that was we, we budgeted together fairly aggressively on the revenues, anticipating revenues bouncing back um, from pre-pandemic levels, but we knew there was some risk in that. So we put a big chunk of money aside um, of these federal funds, a case that, that proved to be overly optimistic. Um, it did prove to be a little bit overly optimistic, but um, the good news is that the expenses also um, have not been uh, expended as, as quickly. So we are going to have um, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of $1.5 million of that uh, revenue replacement reserve still available and needing to be spent uh, before, uh, be committed before the end of next calendar year um, as part of the federal ARPA dollars. And one of the things that those funds can be spent on, the President Biden, one of those funds spent on was uh, <clears throat> public safety expenses. So we, um, uh, since a big part of this budget challenge is the public safety challenge, uh, we, um, uh, I think we need a, a multi-year plan to uh, build these expanded public safety expenses into the structural budget. And this would be the kind of first year of that plan using these revenue replacement, uh, the leftover revenue replacement reserve. We will need, we may need, we will make this as minimal as possible, but we may need to, to supplement that further with one-time funds um, to cover the whole gap. And then um, the third bullet is the fleet gobble, which again, Catherine will detail a little bit more when we get there. There, we have a structural challenge as well. Um, the fleet, there is a committee that is working on this and that has identified uh, basically fleet related one time sources for more than half of, of that challenge. And um, and then we'll need to supplement that as well. Uh, and to be clear, this is the $1 million. This is to continue to fund. Um, uh, this is not new vehicle purchases. These are to make good on, on commitments for vehicles that we have, lease commitments, basically. Um, the final bullet is we really don't have more detail in this presentation, but um, basically signaling that uh, in the refinements of the budget that are going to happen between now and we submit it to you, we expect to be able to address the kind of remind, remaining 750000 of uh, of, uh, of the gap. So now let's get into the each of these a little bit more deeply. So 
council has the ability to make tax assessment for uh, reasonable, I'm supposed to say appropriations for the care and improvement of park property and for the recreational, the city's recreational uh, programming and, and, and meeting the expenses of the department. Um, we have not increased this tax since uh, 2013 and um, we are contemplating doing so. We're adding an additional two, two cents here, which would yield approximately $1.1 million. And if we were to do that and the, um, the uh, other taxes, uh, we, there will be other taxes that go up, the debt service related tax. We committed to that going up with our past debt service decisions, what are approved debt service positions. Uh, decisions and the retirement it's been has not been a great year for the retirement fund with what's been going on in the stock market. So there will be, of course, we, we mitigate the impact of that through the smoothing that we do. But so, so it's not, it's, neither of those are going to be enormous jumps, but there will be increases there as well. So if you combine all those, uh, we will keep this to a, a still, you know, approximately 5% increase, which in a normal year would be pretty big for us when you consider what's going on with inflation and other expenses. Um, it, to me, it, I, I think it's, I, I, I guess, I think it's something we need to consider. Um, we clearly need to consider it. And I think it's reasonable given uh, what we're all seeing bills go up in other, other areas of our life. This will be comparable to the BSD tax increase as well. Going this, graph this table simply shows the um that this is a reasonable uh appropriation um from from the council in that uh there is you know clearly um an addition there are uh, unfunded expenses beyond the um that parks that dedicated revenues that uh, that we get uh, and we're proposing to essentially fund you know, less than half of that uh, with this change. Then here's the idea with phasing in the public safety costs. And people will remember, we've done this before in a number of ways. Uh, we've done it with public safety um, as recently as uh, 20 to 20, I think it was 18 period when we increased the size of the police department unanimously. Uh, um, you know, not that long ago, uh, uh, we um, we got a federal cops grant that um, paid for uh, all, all, um, all of that increase initially, and then we phased out that increase over time. We're doing something similar with the equity investments, as we kind of as I touched on at the beginning, where where we made those equity increases using federal funds, and then have phased that out, and we're in the third year of, of phasing those out. Um, I think we need to do something similar here if we're going to uh, if we're going to maintain the level of of uh, public safety resources that we have been um, building to through all the changes we've been making together um, over the last you know two and a, two two ish years. Um, the and when we have the police uh, the police presentation, we'll go through in detail. Um, what that looks like on, on paper and how what it how it will kind of continue to project out over the next couple of years. But um, essentially, uh, there will be some continued additional pressure over the next couple of years as we get back up to the 85 officer level. Um, although a lot of that, um, this is the budget year that where a, a pretty substantial amount of that kind of pain of rebuilding happens. Uh, um, the uh, kind of budgetary pay, not uh, you know, we want them here. Um, the um, again, this bullet repeats the idea that we have are, are going to have a substantial amount of this revenue replacement reserve um, left over, and uh, approximately 1.5 million, and hopefully that will be. We may need a little, somewhat more than that, but that will be most of what's needed to kind of be the first year of this multi-year plan. Um, and finally, I think we have the 
the clean issue, which only depends on our end. Yes. Yeah, so apologies, it's sort of stuck in here at the end, but going back to the pin that I asked you to put in fleet, um, this is a brief history of um, our challenge um, going back um, to the FY1718 period, um, which is really where I think the pressures start. Um, there had been a moratorium on any fleet purchases um, because we were in the middle of cleaning up um, some previous financial challenges. Um, that eventually led to a fleet policy and uh, an interdepartmental fleet committee um, being um, approved and put into place. Um, so by the time I got here in FY20, we had our um, resources pooled into one location as the consultant had suggested. Um, and there was an effort to try to make the fleet reserve revolving and sustainable. Then of course, a lot of various staff transitions happened. The pandemic happened. I came in, Martha left, Ashley came, all these things. Um, and there was a lack, frankly, there was a lack of follow-up and um, there was not a foolproof system put into place in FY20 anyway. There were some ideas about how the fleet reserve could be sustainable, um, but it was not a foolproof plan. So um, by the time we get to last year, we're pretty much um, coming to the end of the initial reserve, um, kind of raised the flag about the need to use one-time funds. Um, and by the time we get now here to FY24, um, because we have not been able to identify an ongoing sustainable funding source, we are back to a freeze on new purchases for general fund departments um, because we don't want to make the hole bigger. But we do have um, existing lease payments of a million dollars that are due for FY24, 25, and 26. Um, for FY24, um, the fleet committee has already identified just over $600,000 worth of one-time sources. Um, they're from the gains when we sell our old cars, we put that money kind of back into the till. There's a few impact fees and the very last of the fleet reserve. Um, we will need and we are requesting about $450,000 of one-time funds. Um, that would get us through this year. Then um, as I note on the third bullet, um, we do have this ongoing $1 million need for FY25 and 26, um, that doesn't get us any new ambulances, pickup trucks, bucket loaders. There's all kinds of things, plow trucks that we need. And very few of them um, can we use bonding money for. It's really just the fire trucks. So um, the our estimate for a sustainable level of funding is actually $2 million a year. So that is that last bullet. And that is a lot of information. We have more times to discuss these. Um, I will just note um, that you did not have this presentation ahead of time, but the presentations for this Wednesday have already been posted. So I'm sure the Number one thing you'll want to do after this is go review them, but you will have time sometime in the next 48 hours. And with that, we are happy to take your questions and comments. Go ahead, Mark. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for that um, presentation, although it's a little concerning, I guess. Um, I had a question generally about what percent of 
the budget is represented by salaries and benefits. Is that like it's like a, like I know when I worked um, or when I was on the school board, it was like seventy four percent of the budget, um, which drove a lot. Of, yeah. So in a, in a cola high cola environment, it's going to drive a lot of increase. So if you don't have that number available, it is about eighty percent. Eighty percent. Yes. Ask another and this others. And that includes the police and fire. Yes, as a whole. Of course, there's is um if yes, as a whole of the general fund, if you want a rule of thumb, 80% salary and benefits, 20% everything else. And this is of the 94 million dollars yes. after price. Correct. I had one other one I'll ask, and well, it was under the, um, the principal's um, page uh, slide. You, you were talking about initiatives not being able to be, uh, new initiatives being not being able to be undertaken this year. Were there any that, any examples of things that were either imagined or planned that were going to be done that we now can't do? Um, You know, that's a fair question, uh, Council Barlow. I, I mean, uh, I think in a lot of ways, um, like many organizations, like they're still in this sort of recovery mode, and I don't think there's been a lot of focus on um, new demands of sort of how to how to get things functioning as they were prior to the pandemic. Lots of open vacancies and whatnot. Um, I mean, certainly. Uh, Biggest one that jumps to mind is uh, the kind of library capital camp campaign is, is a tough one. You know, in Memorial, I put Memorial Auditorium in that uh, bucket as well. It's sort of you know these big capital initiatives that you really don't have. Um, but on, on the operational side, I don't know, Catherine, you're probably turning down more. Um, you have a different answer for. Um, I don't. But I think that's because people didn't ask to add on initiatives. They asked more about one-time money to do things. And I think we'll probably have to say no to that too, but we haven't exactly done that yet. So um, I think we should probably get back to you. But it's generally the capital things. It's um, people want to make changes or need to make changes to their building. Um, there's some hiring that people don't want to do, but it, nothing has come across my desk in terms of I have this new program or initiative and we can't do any of it. You know, I think we've been able to fund parts of things and working with department heads. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me take my hand down so that it doesn't confuse me or anybody else. Um, I would like uh, for us to propose, I'd like to propose on the budget principles that we add um, regularly investigating and then incorporating revenue alternatives to the property tax based on an ability to pay. And uh, there are two points in that. One is, the, and the reasoning is, one is to decrease the regressivity of the municipal tax system, and two is to increase the proportion of revenue um, that are being that is coming from non-property tax funds, which, by my figures, are, are about twenty percent. So that that is a, a request that I have uh, for the uh, administration, the board, uh, for my fellow councilors. Um, on that. And uh, would you be so kind, because you did the last uh, meeting we talked about this, to remind me of the studies of uh, revenue alternatives that are happening this year? You did mention uh, something. I raised this uh, at the last budget. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Councilor Bergman, um, I think it's a good suggestion. I, certainly, I think we can add it to the principles, and it definitely, as we um, get into I think there will be an opportunity, although obviously the rest of this process is going to be pretty focused on 
getting you a balanced FY24 budget. Um, I do uh, think we'll have more discussion over the remaining nights about, um, you know, especially since, as we noted, a number of these challenges are going to exacerbate, you know, get, get tougher in the years ahead. Um, uh, I definitely, it's very much on our mind that uh, as we search to fill, you know, clearly the future future budgets are going to have some budget holes in them, and that can't they can't all be filled from from the from the property taxes. So uh, definitely, I think that's going to be a principle that we can implement in uh, future budget budget years. Further, um, we do have one study that is getting towards the completion. I actually just got a, a kind of uh, status update briefing on it earlier today, looking at the really focus on the equitability of our current um, property tax system. There's been a lot of national uh, attention on um, how they're real, you know. The municipal property tax systems have major equity challenges um, in almost every city, and we've been trying to examine to what degree we have those challenges here. And so that is not a study that I see immediately generating a lot of additional revenue, but it will make sure that the property taxes that we charge, um, that we... Uh, uh, first of all, I'll tell you the good... I don't, I don't want to get into... I don't want to share all the details, but... Like many things, Burlington is doing does a better job than a lot of our peers, and the study is finding that. Uh, I do think there will be ways that we can do better um, in terms of making sure that our system is is equitable. And so, that's a study that's going to be coming back shortly. There has been some ongoing work for some time that uh, needs to really needs to come to some kind of resolution in the upcoming year around whether there's any opportunity for franchise fee repayments. I wouldn't, we don't have like a consultant study in the field at this point on that, although there has been book treasurer time, Catherine time, and we may, um, we would likely be expending some legal fees on, on that in the upcoming year as well. Um, so that's a big one. And I think there's real potential there. Uh, there is an right thank you, Catherine. There's an impact fee study that is due back towards the end of the year. Um, there too, I would caution. I don't see that as being likely a panacea, and that we already are a very high impact fee municipality. Um, I think uh, so. I don't know to what degree that will um, uh, really. Uh, alleviate these issues. I think it may allow us to use some of those funds in ways that are more, more directly aligned with our current priorities than the current structure does, if you follow me. Um, yep. that, uh, I think um, we've sort of underfunded alternative transportation from those fees in the past. We, we need, the study is gonna help us change that. And um, so I think those are the major ones uh, underway currently. Uh, thank you. That's really helpful. I probably will continue to be a broken record on this um, because um, if we, we only focus on um, expenditures, and I, I understand the need to do that, particularly at this point, then we're engaged in austerity um, work, which is, is basically uh, a downward spiral. So we've got to deal with the revenue, and I'm happy about the, uh, the equity um, work. I mean, the work that was done for many years got us to what I might, like I said, my figures are about 20% of uh, the revenues are coming from non uh, property tax revenues. So by my figures are about $11 million and we did about 42 million uh, in the last budget. If I am reading the, uh, the year end report. Correctly, so I think that uh, we've we have done because we took the efforts, and we will need not to wait until next April to be really having these conversations. So I I, I hope that um, as the studies come in and as thinking is going on, that uh, this becomes um, a real community engagement because uh, we did not get the alternatives to the property tax that we have now without significant community engagement. So uh, I look forward to, to that process. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Councilor Bergman. Well, um, I think the discussion of the percentage of property tax versus non-property tax revenue is a, 
is it is a really interesting one. Kath, Catherine's going to give the. We'll try to have some additional detail. I actually think we're somewhat higher than twenty percent, but we'll we'll have the figures for the the Wednesday um, presentation, so we can dig into that. You know, the flip side of um, you know that we did. Uh, I, I tend to agree with you that it can really help us uh, with service expansions if we can develop some of these other revenue streams. The one one really enduring, really positive thing about having property taxes as the foundation of the budget is they are very stable, whereas many of these other revenue sources are not stable. Um, uh, and um, we saw that during the pandemic. And you know, fortunately, the federal government kind of bailed us out here. Where not for the federal government, these would have been in this uh, this unprecedented revenue replacement. We would have had a really um, uh, it, it's hard to know. It's hard to hard to project exactly how we would have gotten through these last three years. Um, so that is that's just something we always have to keep in keep in mind as we as we look at that. But I basically agree with you. Um, and do you see that as a major part of the uh, FY twenty five and beyond? work that needs to be done. Thank you. I mean, I just to, to, to end, um, one of the reasons that I think our schools have been as supported as they have been in the past is the um, this income sensitivity that the state income that the state education fund has got. And it allows people and allows governments to basically say that folks can afford to do this because we're gonna be basing it on an ability to pay. Obviously there are some changes that need to happen on a state level. So I would love us to be looking at that um, at a city municipal level, because I think that uh, uh, we fall down uh, on the municipal side on, on that. We don't have the similar thing. So I really look forward to this conversation um, going forward. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my first initial reaction to this is an old view we received just a couple days ago. And it was we, we had like 2.5 million gap. Right? And here it just doubled in like overnight. And I just could not. So I expected this presentation actually to tell us okay, we found ways to. Minimize the gap to two point five, and here we actually double today. Um, it's just a little bit confusing to me. That's one, and I think you know also part of the presentation where we had one million dollars in terms of fees, and then we move to the presentation and we see actually we only have four hundred fifty thousand in here. So I I, I just want to wrap my head around what's 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 going on? I I I, I don't know. That's that's my question. Was two point five million now two million? We had one million in pre issue, and now it's an only four hundred fifty thousand for the twenty. And I'm, I'm again <coughs> trying to be very respectful. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yes. The so the fleet issue um, is a. I hear kind of two big questions in there, and, and the fleet is part of the answer to both. But uh, the I, I, it's possible that there we didn't get the text exactly right, but I, I think what was we have a, what what we we're trying to say with the million dollar problem earlier in the presentation is that there is a, a kind of structural problem that we do not have an ongoing. Uh, revenue source for for the fleet, and that's a million dollar a year problem in this year's budget, and next year's budget, and, and the year after that. The um, the fleet committee has worked to find a way to address that sixty percent of that in this year's budget through these sort of other kind of one time fleet related costs, and so. The kind of draw on the, the rest of the budget is only four hundred thousand, but it's it's a real million dollar issue that, uh, that that we've been grappling with. And yes, we found about um, we, we've solved a good chunk of it so far in a sense, but only in that kind of one time sense. 
So hopefully that speaks to that. Um, it is, I, um, I'm not remembering exactly the context that the $2.5 million gap was communicated. Um, and uh, I, my, it, I don't, the fleet issue was left out of, of that calculation. So that's, that's part of the, the difference. And um, uh, I don't know if you want to speak to, I, I think the, the rest is, falls in the category of um, is still being a pretty volatile budget with a lot of moving parts. And hopefully some of what we laid out here for you today proves not to be a, as pink. It gets a little smaller between here and conclusion as well. But. Yeah, and even if we add the flea, it should be around 3.5. So I'm just trying to understand. Right? Yes. We also would like you to understand. I think um, there is not an easy answer here in terms of um, when we when I provided the update at the beginning of April, we used the best information we had at the time, um, which turns out it was not as accurate as we would have liked. Um, I need to be honest with this group that, you know, whenever we start the budget process, we start from last year's budget. Last year's budget was not as accurate as I would have liked. And so some of that involved going back and taking another look to make sure we were getting all of the benefits for police, all of the benefits for fire. And so I feel very confident in these numbers because I we've gone through with my staff and gone person by person, all of the benefits. And so um, what I gave you in April, was still at a high level. We had not received all of the detail from all of the departments yet, and perhaps was a bit tasty. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So another question is about the charities. And one of them is a pandemic shortfall, impact shortfalls that we identified. And I was just wondering if you can help us, you know, not today, but now, Going from 2021 to 2022 to 2020 now, and just see the, the, the impact of the pandemic. Yeah. I can't see why um, we're still having like issues about revenues. Mm -hmm. The pandemic is not here. Okay. Yeah, I think it will be, it will be good. Great. Um, and another question is specific to me. I would love that, you know, OCD departments. We understand also the percentage, that percentage around this budget, right? you know. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I believe that in 2020, until 2020, it's had like 90% of the budget back then, right? And what does it represent now? Um, you know, and, and also about the police, if we think about 90% of the general fund, and after the attrition of 100 police officers to 70, you know, we could not identify these are the same, these are the resources we say the city could not do because of overtime, because of a lot of other things. And now we are rebuilding, and now we are adding the CSA, the CSO, CSL, all, all of this. I think we need to better understand what, 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 what's going on about it. It's like, yeah, like the. So I understand where that question coming from. The, the, we have a good document that I'll, we've been working on for some time that really shows those those changes over time. That you know that one of the frustrating and I think it was frustrating for everyone discussions we had in the past is not being able to identify savings. Is we had already in that first year we had already booked a bunch of the savings even before the because of the pandemic, we had already taken a million dollars in cuts out of the police department before the uh, racial justice resolution and, and, the, and, and the push for attrition. And so we had already essentially, uh, and that, that made that 
there being no savings at all in the first year. There definitely were in the last two years, we've had very high attrition numbers that have effectively been um, savings that we've banked on. So I think we'll have a pretty clear document for to be able to kind of lay out both the, what what's happened now, why we're you know more than a million dollars higher this year than next year than last year, as where as what where this is headed when we get back up to the authorized head head count, you know, 85 head count. So that and I think that we'll do that next Monday, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um and now don't you think it would be timely now for every single city department to go into the review? Into looking into saving mechanism within that department. Uh, maybe an expert then can consult this. And I think um, I think that would be good. And I don't know if you can commission that before July. Before we change. <laughs> change every single one of them to find ways that we can reduce expenses. The scholars here. Yeah, I think it will be good. Right. But thank you, and again, I'm trying to be very respectful. Thank you. I appreciate your questions, Councilor Chang. Thank you. Uh, Councilor McGee. Uh, I believe uh, Councilor Grant is uh, in the attendees list and had her hand up first. Thank you. Let me find her and promote her. Yes. Professor Grant, we can see you. If you uh, the floor is yours if you want to ask a question. Thank you. Hopefully I don't use you because I've uh, getting ready to get into my car and sometimes the Susie Wilson over, uh, bypass is not kind to Zoom connectivity. Um, so uh, along the lines of uh, what Councillor Dang was just bringing up, I would definitely like to see um, that document that you were talking about or in, uh, anything else that can be prepared. I really like to take a good look at the police department over the last six years. Um, I also have a comment um, understanding that it can't affect the next uh, fiscal year, but in terms of long-term planning, um, the issue with the Howard Center uh, so I initially thought they had pulled out because of their um, issues around uh, labor shortage. But then I got more information saying that we made a decision that we didn't want to continue with them because we didn't want to look at a model that would be for Chittenden County. Um, I, I would love to have like something official in writing that states what the decision process was around, um, you know, saying that we'd want to pull out of it because I do think that it is worth considering in the future that we do look at a model for, um, Chittenden County because that would allow for, potentially additional state funding and also the regional funding from the other towns that are being serviced by CARES. I work in Essex Junction. I know that there is a drug problem in Essex Junction. I know there is a drug problem in South Burlington, et cetera. So as the, the program starts in Burlington and then gets built out, it would offer other funding options because quite frankly, what we're seeing is a Chittenden wide um, situation. I would also say that I know another part of this is related to all the problems around dispatch. The, the situation with dispatch is, I, I totally get it, but we have to at some point, that's gotta be fixed. And then if it's fixed, maybe that can work better encompassing working with the other um, cities and towns. 
Um, and then finally, I had a question about the fire department's budget. I was a little concerned uh, because their EMS budget ran out early, I believe mid-April, if that is correct. How are we addressing this with the fire department in terms of the fact, given that they are um, first responders with uh, regards to drug overdoses? Um, and that is probably, actually, I shouldn't say probably, that's what's driving a lot of their um, EMS cost because they can't always bill for the services that they provide if people refuse to be transported. And of course, we don't, don't want them forcing people to be transported. Um, so if we could comment on that, I'd, I'd be curious how um, the fire department will be taken care of. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councilor Grant. I, I think the uh, the questions that you asked uh, with respect to uh, the departmental budgets will, thanks for the heads up that you have interest in those and we'll make sure that when we get to the departmental budgets um, that we are able to, to speak to them there. And um, as far as uh, the Howard Center decision um, there, I'd be happy to communicate with you further and counselors who are interested in this decision further uh, about that. Um, and it was, um, you are correct that one, one of just, but just one of a number of concerns about the Howard Center response was uh, the fact that um, we uh, think this, at least initially, um, I think your concept that that, that could expand maybe to other, municipalities over time is, you know, perhaps once it's uh, up and running, that's something that could be looked at, but the initial funding is coming from Burlington and the state and uh, to us, we thought it was appropriate, you know, that it, it'd be a real Burlington focus um, uh, at, at the initial stage. Regional efforts are very hard as our, as our dispatch um, experience continues to show, but I'm happy to, you know, Happy to engage further, and I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll communicate further on that. Thank you. Um, okay, now uh, let's see. We'll go to you, Councilor McGee. Thank you. Um, I just uh, had a quick question about the um, vehicle fleet numbers. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding those correctly. So we're looking at one million just to meet the current obligations we have for FY24. And is that, so 1 million would meet our current obligations yearly going forward and we would need an additional million to be able to um, uh, remove yeah. that, that purchasing freeze? Yeah, Councilor McGee will, and we can, um, when, we can get into further detail um, in later presentations as well, but the, yes, the million dollars is for the purchase, the vehicles that we are already in service that we've for a number of years been signing these you know, five or seven cases, I think most of them are five or seven year leases. And so just to complete those leases, we have um, uh, about a million dollars a year in, expenses for those for those existing vehicles what the fleet analysis is you know as a kind of going forward medium you know uh, term issue is that uh, a more stable annual funding would be uh, approximately two million dollars a year okay thank you um, and if we could just get uh, at some point a, a breakdown of the one-time um, funds that yeah. have been identified uh, that 60% of the 1 million for uh, FY24, that would be helpful. Thank you. President Paul. Uh, thanks. So, um, yeah, sort of hard to comment on something very global, especially when you're seeing it for the first time. I would make the request that this point on that we not receive 
there be no presentations that are not posted in advance so that we have a chance to really look at them and preferably given days. So if there's a meeting on a Monday, that by Wednesday or Thursday, that information is posted. Um, the, um, the only thing that I that sort of came out to me, and we can discuss it when Wednesday, is that um, one of the things that I thought would be, you're talking about a funding gap of $5 million. That's not a large, that's, that's small enough that you can sort of see where that is coming from. When it's you know, a large, large number, it's broken up into lots of bits and pieces. But in this case, it's some fairly big chunks. Um, one of the things that I'm still trying to understand is, um, you know, you don't be, it doesn't appear to me that the cost um, of uh, outsourcing an RFP to the city for the city attorney is going to equal an additional $50,000 a year. And that's what you have budgeted for is $50,000 of an increase. And that's only under the line item of regular full time, which an RFP is not regular full time. It would be a consultant, or it should be a separate line item. So I, I think that should be, as I say, I think that should be a separate line item. And I, I'm sort of at a loss to understand how um, hiring an outside law firm charging private law firm fees is going to only amount to fifty thousand um, dollars because I looked at the I looked at the, the salaries for that and matched it up against the benefits and it's six percent um, but it's a six percent across the board so that's where a lot of those numbers are coming from and I, I think that we have to just if we're going to go and do if we're going to go and do outsource the city attorney's role, I think we have to be on, be transparent about what that cost is going to be, um, and that it be a separate it be a separate item. Um, so, I I sort of wonder if that five million dollars isn't actually more than that, um, just based on just based on the fact that I I I checked around and spoke with other private attorneys and. I think the cost of it is going to be significantly more than just hiring a city city attorney, even with benefits. Um, so that to me is a significant amount of money when you're talking about trying to close a gap. I think we just have to put that out there unless we're going to hire a city attorney. The other the other things I you know I'm just not in a just not um, I, I sort of have to absorb. What you've what you've given us, and try to understand, um, you know, what some of the other what some of the other uh, gaps are, um, and I'm not sure. I, so what you're saying is, as far as the the parks and rec, is that we can we can increase that. You know, are there other um, are there other taxes or other fee the, the parts of the property tax? The 19 or so, or 18 or so different funds. Are there others that could be increased? For example, the library that cannot be increased unless it goes to the voters. So there's a list of all of them, and then what has to be voter approved, which can be. And I think the only ones that I can remember are retirement, which can go up, and um, uh, uh, debt. So this is one of the other ones. I don't know how, I can't remember off the top of my head how many there are, but that's one of them. Yes, I also cannot remember, but let's call it 18. Yeah, um, it's a lot. I worked closely with Haley and others in the city attorney's office, um, and we went through every single one to see where the authority was and if this body or city council could um, approve any other increases without voter approval. It appears that parks is unique in the way that it's written, where it says it's a minimum of two cents, and it's the only one that does not provide a ceiling, just a floor for a minimum. The ceiling is reasonableness. That's the ceiling. 
and the floor is two cents and we've always charged more than two cents. As far as I can tell, we've always charged at least 2.5 cents. So we've exceeded that floor and you know the ceiling is reasonable less, which is um, part of the reason um, I put the calculation in there so that you could see how much parks expenses was left over and that it's far more than the 1.1. Um, the other thing also is, I mean, I, it, it has been, I don't, I think we sort of, sort of temporarily, I was hoping it was only temporarily um, sort of shelved the idea that under, um, under probably, I think when Beth was CAO there and, and before that, there were, and certainly with when Bob Rest who was CAO, there were, there were projections that were done over three years. Um, that was done by resolution that was created back in probably 20, 2012, 2013, mostly in response, you know, I, I wrote that. It was in response to a CAO that was concerned about the number of initiatives that were coming forward with no spending, with no um, no plan for where the money was coming from. Um, that was a fairly elaborate spreadsheet, but it had a lot of value to it. Um, and given the fact that we are now, you know, to a large part in a post-COVID world, um, with no money that's literally showing up at her doorstep. Um, it's, I think we, I think we owe it to the taxpayers and ourselves to be realistic in what we, what we can do, what we cannot do, um, you know, and what the, what the ramifications of those, of the decisions that we've made, for example, to and I think most people agree. 70% 70, 70 of the of the voters agree that building a high school was a, a huge priority. I think we all agree with that, but there is a cost to that. And that cost, you know, going forward, I think that we should have that in a transparent way so people understand what can and cannot be done. So that would be my suggestion is to try to get that. I don't, I can I will I can find it if you can't find it, but it's a fairly it was a fairly elaborate spreadsheet, but very valuable. Great, thank you. Yes, President Paul, I've been, um, I had a feeling you might um, uh, remind us of, of the three-year budgeting. And uh, I um, I think particularly with some of the challenges that we're facing that, so the police budget that you will see is, a, is effectively a three-year budget kind of projecting out to the, this kind of stabilized uh, department with all the, changes that we made together and um and uh um i i think it at least elements the budget by the time we conclude this process we uh, if we can do a good full three-year budget great um there were a lot of as i recall like a lot of those ended up being well i, I see this i think there's some particular areas where we really you can we will be some increasing pressures over the next three years and i think we should capture that in some of the budget communications before the end here and we'll try to do a good overall one but um you know this fleet issue the public safety maybe maybe several others it really is uh we can kind of see where we're headed and we should capture that uh <clears throat> council Barlow. No one else is waiting. Um, I just wanted to build on something that uh, Councilor Jang and Council Paul just sort of hit upon, and this idea of um, we sort of owe it to the to the public to sort of defend the any increases that we ask them to burden shoulder, whether or not it's this this parks uh, this parks line item or. A voter uh, increase to the a group increase to the budget, um, and, and you know if we have like I don't know it's not like ninety five or one hundred million dollar budget, eighty percent of it is salaries and benefits driven by coal increases. We have like twenty million dollars, let's say that's non um, salary benefits. Um, if we should try to find every year as a as a budgeting principle. You know some saving savings we should ask departments you know what can you save um if you were to save a million dollars that's only five percent of that 20 million dollars and 
I think that everybody in there, especially the residents of Arlington right now in this inflationary environment, they're having to find, you know, savings in their own household budgets. And we should at least attempt to find, I'm not saying we'd be successful in it, but we should attempt to find that every year. Um, you know, some of the things that we prioritized and spent money on last year, maybe, or five years ago that we're still budgeting for may not be as appropriate as they were, or may not be prioritized to the highest, to the top of the list anymore. So I think um, we do, we do sort of owe it to the public to try to find those savings where we can. And that way, when we go and we ask for more money, they know we've at least done that, that part, you know, of what's what all households have to do when they do their budgeting. So um, I think that's an, an important part as just an organizing principle around the budget process. And, um, and I don't view it as austerity. Um, I think it's just, you know, continually sort of evaluating how, how we're spending money and, and making sure we're spending it in the highest, highest and best way. And I also think it, it does, it gives voters the trust that they need when we do ask for more, for more money. So I know it's, that's very sort of high level in general, but you know, we could look at more specific departmental budgets as we go along and maybe there are things. Um, I know that when uh, Councillor Carpenter and I have been doing this monthly, um, you know, coffee with counselors inspired by the mayor's Wednesday's coffees. And what we what we hear is people, the, the things that people care most about are schools, and we can check that box. We, we've got the new high school coming, public safety, and, you know, streets and sidewalks. So, you know, if we can cover those first and then make the arguments for everything else, I think uh, we'd be uh, serving the public well. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor Barlow. I think we will have um, I take your point, and uh, um, I do think, uh, I just hope it's clear that to, to some degree, uh, every department has been pushed in that direction with the kind of holding uh, of the non-personnel expense lines in the face of uh, rising rising costs. And, and generally, uh, people, department heads are, are achieving that. And, and doing that in some ways through some of the kind of innovation and shifting around that you're looking for. We tend to keep it maybe too behind the scenes. So what I'm hearing from you is that it would be helpful to make that more transparent so we could report back on that to constituents. So we can certainly work on that. And I'm thinking of one particular example, and maybe we'll talk about it on Wednesday because Scott Parker will come. And one of the few areas where we did have to um, raise the line item is computer licenses and maintenance or something. And it's like a $600,000 line item in IT's budget. And while it went up by it's close to $50,000 this year, the, store, the other part of the story is that since Scott has been here, he has collected all of the IT services and platforms into IT so that they're not all around the city and has actually cut a lot of the superfluous um, computer programs that we were paying for. And it's like $4,000 here and $10,000 there, but it's all added up. So instead of an additional $100,000 this year, it's only an additional 50,000. So it's things like that. And I think we can get you the details of that kind of work so that it doesn't go unnoticed or unrecognized. I think it's just helpful to sell, yeah. sell the budget. Yeah, that makes sense to me. That's okay. Right. Yeah. And I mean, thank you for saying that to you. Um, and I, I, I think what I, what I really think is we can even identify over 20 million dollars in terms of savings. If we do it with government's expertise and knowledge in this area. And this also includes cross departmental sharing, let's say communication. Why do we need a communication staff for every single department? Right? We just bought a bucket truck, $350,000 just last week ago. Right? And we know that for the department, have it. how do we make that happen? How do we make that happen? Um, there is one element of this budget also 
that I do not think fits in here because it's talking about climate change. And we know that the resources from EPD are in charge, and those are like more occupies. I do not understand it really well as part of this presentation. Um, yeah, Councilor Jay, it was really, it was to make that, that point that um, part of the, uh, in this, that, that we are not stepping away from this commitment to, you know, despite the budget challenges that the, that the presentation was focused on, um, we are going to, we are going to continue to make these sort of leading investments in the climate. True. Through the funds and media, I think the bullet called after that was a the item. So um, you're right. It was sort of done totally. I, I think uh, it feels um, may not be intuitive to a lot of people that the climate uh, initiatives would not be in the general fund budget, that they would be in the utility budget. So um, uh, that was to kind of remind folks that the way we've been able to evolve towards given uh, the way our climate efforts have uh, evolved, and, you know, that they're so focused on this electrification that, that we have the regulatory authority and the budgetary ability to fund through BED that we're still doing that. So I just didn't want anyone to read this presentation and think, uh, there's no thing about climate here. We don't care about climate anymore. So it's, it's still happening. <laughs> Um, another question is specific to Okay, yeah. we'll come back to you if you think of it. Um, we'll go back to you, Councillor Grant. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to agree with the um, statement that uh oh i'm sorry just a second uh i can ride with you after i ask this question yeah no take your okay I got box. okay awesome thank you thank you sorry everybody i'm on uh diaper distribution tonight <laughs> so i'm just uh meeting with the person that um we're going to be uh dropping off some nappies uh to some families who need a little help um I agree that with regards to departments demonstrating where they're making cuts, that's going to be really important um, from a you know public engagement standpoint. And I know that will make me feel comfortable having an understanding um, of what's being looked at. Um, I had a question about parks, and I have to apologize because at the beginning of the meeting, I was still on work hours. So I, I didn't fully hear the whole explanation behind parks. So my understanding is there's a big shortfall there. I'm just wondering, is, is that related to the additional duties that a lot of our parks team have to deal with with regards to um, the unhoused and, and clean up spots all over the city where people are using because a lot of that falls on the parks team a lot of people think that the police department deals with that but um that is actually mostly dealt with with people who work for parks so uh councillor grant um uh, it, yes any costs associated with the, you know, those expenses are captured in the analysis that, you know, you'll see when you're in a place where you can look at the presentation in, in the kind of car, parks budget. Um, and um, so it does contribute to that. I mean, it isn't that that hasn't, hasn't that's, you know, two positions and some related costs. It hasn't been a massive expansion and uh, no one, the, the fact that we are looking at this as a possible, um, Kind of budget solution shouldn't be taken as an indication that the the parks budget has um, jumped dramatically. It's uh, it's one of the solutions available to us uh, for addressing the the challenges in this budget. Okay. 
can we get a comparison with the previous years around staffing costs? Yeah, when we get to the departmental budget, you'll you'll that's one of the things that we provided for each but each each department. Okay. And is it just a comparison to last year or does it go into multiple years? The way I have um, it set up right now, Councillor Grant, is um, it goes back to FY19. Um, okay. So, um, and that was something that we had talked to Councillor Hightower about last year because we were trying to look at, um, you know, to look at quote unquote the before times. And so we wanted to look at 19 and 20. There is a logistical issue with New World in that you can only have so many comparison columns. So what I have decided to do is to give us the actuals for 19, 20, 21, and 22, and not worry about what the budget was for those years. If someone wants that for whatever reason, you can let me know, I will get it to you. But every budget that you will see has 19, 20, 21, and 22 actuals. Then 23 budget, because we don't have the actuals yet, and then 24 proposed. So I'm hoping that gives you the information that you're looking for. If people have, that's how everything is for Wednesday that's already been put up. Um, but if there's more or different information you would like, just let me know. Uh, that sounds great. Seeing the actuals is, is really what it comes down to. It, at this point, doesn't matter what the what the budget was, but having that comparison for actuals will be uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. Great. All right. Seems like uh, seems like we're slowing down with the questions. Um, do you want to just kind of just like maybe just review that last slide again on kind of. Where we're going from here. Yes. To share. So, tame your excitement, but we will be back here on Wednesday. Um, and on Wednesday night, we have. Clerk Treasurer, who, Human Resources, Airport, Library, City Attorney, IT, and Planning. The only change from the published schedule was that uh, BCA is not presenting on Wednesday the 10th. They're moving to Wednesday the 17th. We've got seven presentations that day. Then Monday the 15th will be BPD. And then I have somehow forgotten the 22nd, but you should not forget the 22nd. So then we'll have Wednesday the 17th and then Monday the 22nd, and that will get us all the way through all of the departments. Then we'll come back here on the 30th and um, hopefully by then any feedback you've gotten from the departments um, will be incorporated. We can take another look at it. And then on the 20th, um, the city council will act on it, which means the board of finance should act on it before the 20th on Monday the 12th. Any other questions? I, just, I think we got, we should. <clears throat> I agree it's likely we're gonna need a board. Usually we need a board finance meeting somewhere between um, you know, maybe the one on the 30th. Uh, we often take more input there. I, I think it's definitely possible we'll need something between the 30th right. and, and the vote on the 20th. We have a charter responsibility to submit the budget before the 15th. So the 12th might be a little bit late for yes. uh, any kind of final discussion. So um, I would, let's, uh, why don't we why don't we next time when we think Catherine about mm -hmm. uh, another date between the 30th and the and the 12th to ask people to hold out in case we need it. If we don't need it after the 30th, 
great, but we do need a slide. We'll get that on there. <clears throat> um, Councilor Grant. I have a quick question. Is it possible to get an email with all those dates? Yes. It just helps. It helped me plan out my schedule and and uh, try to get out of work early on those days. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, very good. Thank you, uh, everyone, for all the engagement and questions. And uh, I, you know, I guess I will just certainly as we work towards. You know, again, especially for counselors that haven't been through this before, um, it is, we've usually been successful over the last 11 years of uh, addressing, getting all the, of, the, of the final approval being relatively smooth, that um, by the time we actually submit this budget, anything that is controversial or there are major questions about, they've been addressed ahead of time. And we really, I hope counselors who've been part of this process in the past can, would, would validate that um, we do our best when we, issues and questions come up. Uh, we do make changes over the course of these discussions that get incorporated into, into the final budget. That's To me, that's the way the system works best because once we hand it off to you, you don't have very much time before the charter requires uh, approval. And um, uh, so the hope is that we can work out questions between now and then. So just... Uh, ask people to have that in mind as we go forward from here and certainly not feel limited to the communications that happen uh, during the meetings. If you have follow-up questions, uh, um, frequently we get follow-up email questions and Catherine, I think in past years, we, you know, questions that have come in, we've made sure the answers go out, not just the person who asked them, but the, to all counselors and, and we'll, we'll follow that um, again. So, Thank you, everyone, and uh, look forward to working through this uh, with you over the next uh, little more than a month. See you again soon.